And we are back, folks, here. Another edition of the Michigan Insider Football Breakdown. And a little bit different as we have this year in addition to the team. Uh, and this man is one of the authorities, at least for me, when I have a question about football, he is absolutely one of the guys that I call because I was once told by a good friend of mine, Marcus Ray, he said, hey, man, uh, you know, Charles Woodson, Hall of Famer, best player to ever play, one of the, one of the probably best defensive back to play in our lifetime, one of the best to ever play at Michigan, if not the best. Yeah, Vance Bedford taught him how to. Taught him how to backpedal. Is that true, Van Pepper? You talk. You taught Charles Woodson how to backpedal, man. Uh, I want to give that one to God and his mom. <laughs> so I just happened to be a, a little the uh, bridge along the way to help him get to where he is today. Hey, man! I just a, a really, really sort of uh, walk down memory lane for people. Vance was was certainly Charles's position coach here. Coach with the Bears, DC, Oklahoma State. You know, DC. Louisville, D.C., Texas, another D.B. stint at Michigan, down in Florida. Hold on. You have been in the league. You've coordinated defenses all over. So you know when a guy is special. How long did it take for you to realize Charles Wilson was special? It's funny you bring it up. The first day uh, we had a freshman camp, and he was Mr. Ohio. I just heard how great he was. I just left Oklahoma State. We have recruited R.W. McQuarters there. We ended up in the first-round pick by 49ers. So the first day of, of camp, we're going, just going through basket and loose. And my man Wood is tripping over bags all over the place. I'm thinking, this is Mr. Ohio, a great player. I'll leave Oklahoma State and Arthur McWhorter to take this guy coming over bags. We come back to the second practice. He was a natural. He was smooth. I mean, he might make a mistake one time, but he's going to correct that mistake. And that's who Charles is. That's why he's such a great player. He won't ever make the same mistake again. Yeah, man, he uh, is definitely – of a different breed, but another guy who I know, I grew up with this guy. You changed, you changed his game too. Made him a standout on that championship team. My lifelong friend, elementary church, elementary school, middle school, high school, <laughs> Dre Weathers. Grew up oh, with Dre man. Weathers. You turned Dre Weathers into, into man, a standout Dre, player. Dre, one of my guys, when I first got to Michigan, they didn't think he was a very physical player. And, you know, we had real big defensive backs with thick hips and, I was a guy I said, Coach, we're going to play man to man. These big, thick up guys, they say they're not corners. So that guy over there with the little hips that can turn, Dre Weathers, that's my guy. Well, you know, he's not very tough, and he's not going to do this and that. And all of a sudden, you know, Clarence uh, uh, Thompson, he got uh, had some issues going into that 97 year. So he didn't make it. And so Dre stepped up. Dre was first team all conference and was a physical football player. But I, I was always a fan of his because he can cover one-on-one. -on -one, he can press. And smart as a whip. And I had Dre Weathers on one side and Wilson on the other. I told Wilson he was a weak one. I said, <laughs> You gave up two touchdown passes. Dre didn't give up any. I, mean, I don't know why you getting all this hype. I mean, so now we had a great time in 97. <laughs> Wait, so they said Dre Weathers wasn't tough. They know Dre Weathers from Flint, Michigan? What do you mean? Well, He's not he, tough. Well, you know what? He might have been from Flint, but I didn't think he was very physical. He must have been playing uh, volleyball or something like that. I have no idea. <laughs> That's Vance Bedford for you. So, Vance, I, I mean, I was tripping over myself, hoping that you would bring some of the expertise that, I mean, I just get a note from Vance that, you know, look at this, look at that, look at this, look at that during games, Sam, what's going on here? What's, what, what, how about that? Look at this, Sam the kinds of things that just a little nugget that'll drop them a, a football knowledge. Both Vance and Al are, are really just, they do that all the time. So, man, let's bring this to the people. So I was excited when Vance said, yeah, let's do this, man. Let's, uh, let's give the people a little dose of what it was like uh, when you were in, in the room coaching guys and coordinating defenses. And before we get into specific plays, just tell me what you thought of Michigan game one, uh, considering that, Western is supposed to be a pretty good offensive team. They're supposed to be one of the better teams in the Matt Caleb Ellaby, the quarterback. There were only two quarterbacks uh, in the country ahead of him in, in efficiency. And both of those guys are first Mac Jones and Zach Wilson first round pick. So this is supposed to be a pretty potent passing attack that Michigan just faced. And yet uh, they went out and held them more in check than I expected them to. Tell me what you thought seeing Michigan in game one. Yeah, I was excited for the defense. It reminds me of that 97 defense, you know, we had 
Uh, we play a lot of zone pressure, man to man, a quarter, quarter, half. And I saw some of the same things. I saw them stemming the defensive front, line up on one defensive look and stem to another front. And that can confuse an offensive line and a quarterback. And the pressure they brought from the middle, from strong side, from weak side, I, mean, I love it. I'm, I think the fans are really excited about the direction that the defense is going in right now. And if the cornerbacks can hold up with what they're doing, you can get pressure up front. I expect big things from the Wolverines this year. All right. So I sat down and, and let's talk concept for a minute. And I want, want to get Al your take on this as well. I sat down with Steve Klink scale. Uh, Klink is an outstanding defensive backs coach. He's had uh, at, at Kentucky. He had a number of draft picks. I mean, you wouldn't expect for Kentucky to be one of the better, one of the best, you know, defenses in the Mac. And they were. I mean, the best defenses in the SEC, and they were. And they were because of the secondary, first and foremost, in my opinion. And so he took some guys and turned them into second and third round picks. Uh, and so I asked him coming in, kind of take me through your thought process, Clint. Are you a spot drop guy or are you a pattern match guy? And so, Vance, I want you to first explain spot drop versus pattern match. And then take me through how you did it. And then I'll tell you what Steve Klinkscale said about what he is philosophically. So spot drop versus pattern match. What, what are those concepts? And then how did you do it? You know, spot drop, when you're rushing five guys or you're playing to rush a four plant three zone, guys have a tendency to have landmarks on the field. So when a ball is snapped to recognize pass, they drop to those particular spots on the field they read the quarterback and they break off routes. Uh, when you say pattern match or, or pattern read, everything is based off receivers. That's just like playing three on three basketball. Mm -hmm. They have three, we have three. If they try to run a pick, we just sit, sit and wait for a guy to come free and hit the guy in my area. So you're going to have a lot closer coverage. And, and watching Michigan uh, the other day, they appear to be more of a spot drop at times. And as an old DB coach, I believe in simplicity. Mm. You know, I wasn't smart enough to teach both. <laughs> so we, we matched up. I wanted to be as close as I possibly could to make throws tough on the quarterback to buy more time for the D-line to get home. Because you have a 20-hour rule in college. Three hours of game day, so now you have 17 hours. So you have to look at the teaching time for your players. Now, the next thing you got to add is a weight room. They're going to have maybe three hours of a week in the weight room. So now you go from 17 to 14 hours of practice and meeting time. So the simpler you can make things, the faster guys can play on game day. If they can play fast and mistake free, you win a lot of ball games. Yeah. And so when I asked Clink this question, he said, Hey man, I, I think you got to be a little bit of both. Now what exactly a little bit is, I, I don't know. Uh, and even if he explained it to me, not being a coach, I probably still wouldn't understand, but he said, uh, I think you got to be a little bit, of both i i don't think and i want to pull up the first clip that you saw vance because it was an example of at least right now at least right now as we get to learn what this defense is at least right now it seems like they're more of a spot drop team and you you picked this out so for, first al i'm curious what you think of the idea of both of being able to to be both have you have you seen examples of that heard examples of that being done in any expansive sort of way in all your travels well i've seen teams try and spot drop and, and match but usually they weren't very good at one of them <laughs> <laughs> the, the uh the match teams were good at matching and the spot drop teams were pretty good at spot dropping but trying to mix the two i know i work with ron english at uh sensei state and ronnie and i are Pretty good buddies. I never, Ronnie, what are you going to do? Because Ronnie coached all match, you know, in quarters, which so many people do. And he says, I haven't got time to coach. I don't know how long I'm going to be. I don't know how I have time to coach all that. We're going to be a one high team. We're going to spot drop. We're going to play man free. And that's what I'm going to coach. I, I mean, I, I coach that other stuff. I'm comfortable with it. But I don't know if I can get the message sent in time to, to get where we want, you know. So his deal was, he loved coaching match on it, but he just didn't think he could do both and do it effectively. And as I've seen more and more teams and I noticed the NFL is going to more spot drop because in my day, when I, first, everything was spot drop, there were no match zones. 
But as I got more into it, uh, cover four revolutionized offensive football as much as defensive football in that people were, as coach was saying, the, the, the coverage got tighter, the throws got tighter, and uh, it was you had to rethink how you were attacking defenses. With the spot drop teams, you, you could check the ball down and, you know, throw 80 percent of your passes complete and, and, uh, and, you know, move the ball really with your passing game. But I think what a lot of people did, use, use your running game, as, use your passing game as kind of a running game. Whereas I think what, what, what the matches did, the match zones kind of took a little bit of that away. Mm-hmm. So I always say, guys, so what, what's the biggest changes for you in football? I started coaching in 1976. And the, the things that revolutionized offensive football were quarters coverage and zone pressures because one made you rethink how you were going to attack the perimeter with your stretch concepts. And the other one made you rethink your pass protection. So. Gotcha. All right. So Vance very, very early. And I'm going to pull up the first illustration here, Vance, and you can talk us through it. So let me share it on the screen. And so you, you highlight, tell me, tell me, tell the folks about the highlights here. Yeah. You know, the key right now is for the nickel and the safe that you see them tied together. Mm-hmm. So I have those guys highlighted because the nickelback's coming, the safety is going to replace him in a particular zone. And now the quarterback is going to read safety down to the nickelback mm-hmm. as far as his reason where to go with the football. And the back is blocking away from the protection. A lot of people like to blitz the back. So therefore, they slide the protection away from where the back is, and he's going to go to the tight end side for protection. Right. And so you saw this, uh, and this was an example to you that hey, Michigan, at least right now, uh, to, to sort of keep with what you said, you know, uh, what, is, what is keeping it as simple as possible? Like, like Al said, for, for them right now, it seems like it's only one game, but it seems like they are skewing more towards being a spot drop team. And you looked at this play and said, oh, yeah, this, this is an example of that. And so as we roll back through the telestration, you can tell the people, how you spot it, spot drop. Like, what were your keys to tell you this is a spot drop versus them being a pattern match team? So you could talk them through it as we get through the telestration, and then we get to the play. So, what did you see there that let you let you know that? What what would be the difference if they were pattern match? You know, right now, first of all, I would talk about the formation of cut splits to the field and cut splits to the bottom. I would think you might get double crossing routes, or you can get some type of uh, smash route as a corner route and the hitch rock to the field. So when the safety dropped down, I watched the safety and both linebackers, their eyes went directly to the quarterback. Mm-hmm. So therefore, they're going to be late to break if you, as far as what's going on. So if I was just teaching this safety coming down, so right now as he came down, I don't care about the quarterback. I'm working number two receiver to number one, and I'm pushing right now to the guy in the flat. Mm-hmm. And the cornerback's climbing on the top now. If you look at the middle linebacker, he should be pushing a little bit wider to his side because everything's coming to him. So you can see the linebackers and the nickelback, everybody's eyes on the quarterback right now. And that's an example of spot dropping. The quarterback tells you where you have to go. Mm-hmm. And so really uh, uh, there was no, I mean, they, they had a good play call for this. They, they weren't going to stop that uh, at this point. Well, right? right now you could say that, but again, you don't know what this team's going to do the first game when you assess the problem. But see, Michigan's only rushing four. Mm-hmm. That means they have four in the knee. So what they could have done with the safety rolling down is bring them right down on the top of the receiver on the line of scrimmage. Mm-hmm. That'll put them in closer proximity to the guy going in the flat because they're rushing four and they're dropping four. So they have enough guys, per se, to stop this route. They will see this route again in the Big Ten. Okay. And you don't want to give us up to Ohio State. We might have a guy to run, you know, a 4-3 and a 40, and now you got to make open field tap. Gotcha. All right. So that's an adjustment they're going to have to make. Gotcha. All right, Coach Bedford. So another one. And so both of you guys work with a coach named Greg Madison. And both of you, <laughs> both of, both of you guys had the same reaction to this blitz, to this blitz. And so I – it made me, as you talked about, it, I was like, well, is it a Ravens blitz or is it a Greg Madison blitz? Uh, because Michigan, uh, Michigan ran it. Greg Madison isn't on staff, but their defensive coordinator is from the Ravens where, where Greg Madison was once, once a DC. So I'm going to 
show this. This was a, you know, Michigan ran a, a, a you know, a lot of, of, of movement with their nickel. A lot of, he was like a chess piece for them uh, in, in showing, uh, in showing a coverage and doing something different. The disguise was often based on what Dax Hill with the nickel was doing. So uh, talk me through this, this barrel cross blitz. They, you show pressure from your nickel. He drops back in the coverage and still makes the play. So talk me through this one, Vance. What you're doing, you bring the two inside backers. Okay. So again, the nickel and the safety, they show him pressure, trying to get the quarterback and protection to turn to them. And now he's going to drop out. The quarterback is still looking at the nickel back to the safety for his read and for his protection checks. And you bring in the linebacker to the field. He goes first. The linebacker to the boundary. He comes second. The backside safety is going to the post. You playing a strong 3D. Right. And they get great penetration with the backers up in the front. Makes the ball come out extremely fast. Right. And then uh, even though Dax Hill winds up out here after showing pressure and then dropping out of it, he still comes up and makes the tackle. And he was... He was a tackling machine all day long. And that, that was a tremendous job. And again, I'm giving an example of spot dropping again. Everybody's eyes on a quarterback and the ball comes out fast. You have two guys breaking on the ball right now. Mm-hmm. Yep. So this was a this was a a, a blitz. And I, I said this to you, man. Sorry. So Greg Madison was running this. What did you 1996. Back in 96? Is that really? 19, we got it from the Pittsburgh Steelers. We went to visit the Pittsburgh Steelers that summer prior to the season. And a lot of the zone pressure that we were running, we picked up from them. Because they were one of the first teams in the NFL to start doing zone pressures. Dick and they LeBeau. were 100% match at the time. Yeah, Dick LeBeau. Yes. And we spent two summers in a row going to visit the Steelers. And a lot of guys in the NFL who left the Steelers, they went to the Ravens and Carolina and other people. And uh, that's where most people got it from. We used to call it two, three match. We were hundred percent match coverage. We didn't drop very deep. We wanted to lock on guys as quick as we possibly could and buy time for the front to get there. And the best thing I saw in that diagram there is the nickel back showing pressure because now the offensive tackle and the back, they got to eyeball him. That enables the, the two backers to have a chance to come scot free and get pressure on the quarterback, which is what they did. All right. So, Let's talk about one where the nickel, from a coaching perspective, you're going to be talking to him a little bit different. Uh, you know, that was an example of a great play by your nickel. Here's one where they probably went back and said, all right, all right, Dax, we, we had a great game. We had a great game, Dax. This is, a, this is something that we're going to see from other teams. They're going to try to attack us with this, with this three-level flood. Let me share this screen so you guys can – can see it and talk us through it. All right, so the telestrations will, will start firing in advance, and then you can uh, you can go. So the reads fire first for the quarterback. Still, the quarterback still looking at the safety to the nickel back. As you guys can see, the route, the outside guys doing a vertical route. The number two guy stems inside, runs a corner route, and the back goes to the flat. This route takes a long time. A lot of people don't want to run this route. It's good versus any coverage if you have time. So if I was a defensive coordinator, I'm going to my defensive line coach and say, give me some pressure. This this is a four-second throw. Let's get a push in it. Now I'm going to the secondary. And the first thing I always tell the nickelback, which I hope is a cornerback, if number two stems inside, gain width and depth. That nickel back is playing like a corner right now. Mm-hmm. It's like playing a cloud cover two out there. And he has to play from top to bottom. So if number one, the back comes at him and two releases inside, gain width and depth, play the corner route, back to the low throw in the flat. Let's see what happens. All right. So uh, I know I have him squ- coming up a little bit. He really didn't step that far up. He, he stayed. He kind of maintained his position here instead of getting depth. Yeah and working his way up to the flat. And so they were able to go behind him. See, but watch number two stems inside of him. See that? Mm-hmm. He jumped the back right now. He knew he made a mistake right away. He knew he made a mistake right away. And I always tell corners, in this situation, nickelback, if two stems inside, 
and three comes at you, get width and depth for the deep throw. And we will have a better chance of making that play. The safety, in my opinion, he's not going to make that play. If he does, then that receiver should not be on scholarship. He might be a walk-on. <laughs> hey, Vance, how would that change? Does it your cha- thinking change any if you're matching or you're spot dropping that? In, if, if, in, it, in this situation, they playing like a – people call it a cathy, a soft cover two. When a corner is cleared out, then the nickelback technically become the corner. So even if you're matching – it's still the same. You still, still got to play yeah. hollow routes. Nothing yeah. changes whatsoever. Yeah. You want to take away the deep throws first and react down to the low throws. Right. You got to think a 15-yard throw or a three-yard throw. Where do you want to stop it? 15-yard throw. Right. And so, as you said, oh, the other one, they're going to see this. They're going to see this for sure. Yeah. Yeah, right? Right. They'll see this route again. No doubt. No doubt. All right. So, uh, there was there was a pivotal – third and two. This one does not have telestration. All right. But there was a, a pivotal third and two early uh, in the game. It was, I think it was the third drive of the game for, for Western Michigan. And man, when I say uh, they blew up a split zone, like Michigan didn't have a split zone blown up all day, but, but Michigan blew up Western Michigan split zone. And I, I thought this was a like, Ronnie Bell's touchdown was a tone setter. This third and two stop was a significant moment in the game. And so I want you guys both to react to this one. Uh, and this is, this is probably the defensive play of the game, I would call it. All right, so you got that on the screen there, fellas? Have it on the this screen. The one All right, so, all one. Yeah. yeah, so this yeah. is uh, 11.53 in the second quarter, third and two. And... Michigan is up 10-7. Yeah, I got to be honest right here. If I was a head football coach at Michigan, we met that Sunday. This is the first play going to be on the screen. I'll say this was Michigan defense is all about. It's third down and two. We know they're going to run the football. Look at the D-line. They're handing the dirt. They're ready to go. They're in a four-point stance. we pressing a single receiver outside. This is what it's going to take for us to win a Big Ten championship. This is going to be Wisconsin. This is going to be Michigan State. This is going to be the Ohio State. This is what Michigan football is supposed to be like. If we do this every single game. We will win the Big Ten championships. I, I have them jumping out their seats right now. Sam, they'd be jumping up and down. So I'm taking my shirt off. I'm throwing <laughs> things around. I'm like, this is Michigan football. Big blue. Let's go. I'm fired up right now. I'm hey, Al, you taking up your pride. shirt too, Al? No, they'd all turn to stone if I did that, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So – Split zone is two, you need two yards. They run a split zone. And so first, Aiden Hutchinson. I mean, this is where the back wants to go. Aiden Hutchinson is in the backfield right now. And he and it wasn't with power, Vance. He he hits him with a swim move, and Aiden Hutchinson is in the backfield redirecting the play. He is. And, and, and when a D-line play is that great, the linebackers are free. The linebacker runs through the have been on the top. That's how Michigan should play defense every single snap. See, but Watch looking, the backside. The backs, look at where the line of scrimmage line is and look at the impact of the backside on, 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 on when the ball snapped, where all the offensive players are. Watch this. <laughs> Everybody is a yard to a yard and a half behind the line of scrimmage line. You can see the line of scrimmage line there in uh, black. Yeah, man. And it was crazy because he tried to redirect and Mike Morris. Well, like you said, first, the uh, Chris Hinton has pushed the center into the backfield. Mike Morris, he splits. He splits the, um, you know, the, the tackling tackle guard. The guard. Yeah. Yeah. He splits the tackle in the guard and blows them into the backfield. And then the, your edge guy, he blows up the tight end coming coming across everyone, everyone up front destroyed their man yes. on this play. God, dog, look at what the, look at what the nose is doing. That's impressive. Yeah. Now, I know Al is an offensive coordinator. He's watching this play. So I could tell you the next third down in play, he will give me the same formation. He's going to tell the quarterback to keep the ball around the edge because nobody was there. Is that not true, Al? Yeah, probably. And so, If I'm not watching, somebody better be watching that. 
That's <laughs> because right. Because we didn't hold up too well trying to get a yard going straight at him. So it's kind mm-hmm. of mess him and really piss him off. And so because- what, one of the things you talked about, Vance, was disguise. You really highlighted, uh, and this is something that the player, Vincent Gray, um, talked about. Hey, man, you know, we're, we're giving a lot of different looks out there. I'm learning a lot. We're doing a lot different. What I found most interesting was Ronnie Bell. So Ronnie Bell during fall camp was in a was in one of the press conferences and he said, you know, it used to be I come to the line of scrimmage. I know exactly what the defense is in. I know exactly what they're doing. He said now, you know, spring ball, fall camp. I don't necessarily know when we come to the line of scrimmage what the defense is going to do, uh, what cover what the coverage is going to be. And so, Vance, that was one of the things that you really harped on a lot in this game, the disguises that they offer. So I'm going to uh, show this was this was one example that you really highlighted, like this is really good, good disguise, Sam. And so you can talk to people through what you're talking about here. All right. So we got this on the screen. No telestration on this one, Vance. But okay. tell me what you see right now pre-snap. If I'm the quarterback. I see a four-man rush. Look, I'm thinking they're playing cover two. They've been playing mostly quarter, so I think I'm going to have time to throw the football because we could be in six-man protection, and now we can run our base routes because only four-man look. And I think that's it's a soft look. The backer to the boundary, he's walked out. So mm-hmm. I'm thinking he's not coming. The safety is sitting deep. He's not coming. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm in good shape to have time if it's a pass to throw this football right now on second down alone. Right. All right, so then you let it roll. And here you go. Great disguise. And again, they're only bringing four. But you got Aiden Hutchinson dropping off in yep. the stone blitz here. So this is Aiden right here. And see, for any crossing patterns, which you will see in this conference, you know, Grace said, but again, I'm going to go back to my idea about spot dropping. They're only bringing four. They have four underneath. You have guys playing with great vision. So now in a quarterback scramble, they can all see what's going on. And they can drive up to make the play. There were also some examples where you you saw on the other side, uh, guys got fooled uh, with their with their eyes. They got fooled with their eyes, or or maybe they stepped wrong. We'll show one where it was an example of you know they kind of let a guy go uh, in the middle of the field uh, with a uh, with showing some pressure, backing out of it, but but allowing themselves to be leveraged a little bit with some routes. So I'm going to show this. Sam, before you do, can I ask sure. you a question? Um, Vance, how many shells would shell? Would you describe, describe from a one-eye shell? Or would the one-eye shell would have maybe – two different coverages or three different coverages. And then for the two shell, you may have 10 different coverages. I guess I'm just asking when you show a shell, how many times? First and second down. Now, we yes, we're second now third, third down, I'm going to give you even probably more of a single high look and being able to go to two, to a two shell. Mm-hmm. So I want the quarterback to think we're going to go hit him. Right. And then all of a sudden, you can drop and have too deep or playing quarters behind it. All right. All right. So let's go ahead and show this. We'll call this bad zone D. We'll just call this bad, <laughs> bad zone D. An example where, all right, you know, in the meeting, you said, all right, fellas, we had a good game. We blew up that third and two. This Michigan, this is Michigan defense. But this one right here, we're going to have to clean up. I'll say I'm going to call it more of a misassignment than bad defense. We can clean this up with some fundamentals. So right now, Al, that's what we just talked about. Quick, I don't know if you can freeze. You got single high. Okay, it's third down and 10. We're trying to show pressure. The backers all walked up in the A gap. We're playing two, three techniques. So we're attacking protection right now. And they're going to roll to split safeties. In other words, too deep. And the biggest thing, when the Mike backer comes out, he should be aware of the split of the number two receiver, I don't believe he is. Mm-hmm. With those kind of splits of the two outside receivers, this is a good chance those guys are going to walk the middle of the field. And same thing for the backside back. All right. 
That's showing pressure. And says so backer comes out, he must not allow that receiver inside. They just he got him highlighted. Right. So these are your backers right here. Yes. He so can't allow him inside. And the yeah. backside backer. There you go. I'm watching the highlights. The wheel backer needs to at least be 10 yards deep to the sticks. Mm -hmm. If the wheel backer is to the sticks on third and 10, he might make this play. So both backers are wrong here. But it starts with the formation and the splits. Good tackling in the secondary. All day Cause, long. Because <laughs> the first day. thing you, you teach linebackers in the secondary, you teach down and distance, and you teach splits, formations. How can these guys attack us? And right now, I don't think these guys, first game of the year, were aware of that. Right. For the mic coming out, the guy's on him too fast. He's not ready. Look where his eyes are. His eyes went right to the quarterback and the receiver beat him inside. Yeah, if he got a redirect on that, the quarterback might hold it for a beat and he gets destroyed by Aiden Hutchinson. This was a great it. pass rush. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great pass rush. Yeah, if he holds it another split second, he is toast. He is done for on that play. So, uh, again, there was a lot, though, a lot to, to really look at that game and say they showed – they showed some real improvement. The one that I really want to focus on, Vance. So talk me through defensive back technique because Vincent Gray had himself a rough season last year. I mean, everyone knows it. He's talked about it. Uh, you know, teams took liberties. They just threw it up, and if it wasn't a completion, it was going to be a P.I. So there was some rebuilding of confidence. Mike McDonald, they talked about during the broadcast, said maybe the – the, the toughest thing for them as a coaching staff for this team wasn't teaching scheme. It was sort of maybe infusing them with, with confidence or rebuilding their confidence. I think there's probably no bigger example of that than Vincent Gray. Now, on this play, as I share the screen here really quickly, okay. he is facing the fastest player on Western's team. All right. So let, let's, let's stipulate that for the people at the very beginning. He is facing the fastest player on their team and one of the fastest players in college football. This guy is a bona fide sub 4 4 40 guy. All right. And man to man coverage, they're going to take a shot. And they took a shot here at Vincent Gray Vance. And so I'm going to take it to a certain point. Now, right here, Vance, this is. Technically, the receiver has a step and a half on him. That's technically he's beat. Uh, last year at this time, I think Vincent Gray panics. Tell me what you're coaching your defensive backs. What did you coach your defensive backs to do when they're trailing like this and the ball is in the air? Eyes and hands. Don't worry about the ball. You're right. He is beaten. So, therefore, I'm looking at his eyes and hands. I want to put my hand in his hands. At the very last moment, I'm trying to make the guy make a one-hand catch. And he does a tremendous job right here, staying focused on the eyes and the hands. He doesn't reach and grab. It's an inc incomplete pass. That's a nice job. See, now but he's again, he's a, he's a year older, and I'm pretty certain his DB coach sat him down, went through all those plays, and said, you're in great position. Just trust in your ability. He said, we trust you. That's why you're out there. So you got to start believing and just go play football and have fun. That looks like what he's doing right there. Yeah, man, and he started to grab, but then he pulls his hands back yes. and then plays the football. That's a nice job. And and you you talk about a play that maybe is a is a game changer for a guy. Now it's one game, but that mm -hmm. wasn't that wasn't just. I uh, let me reiterate this this point because uh, you know I saw people saying after the game, "Oh, it's it's Western Michigan," and you know, I mean, do it against the real team. They had a, a receiver on this squad last year named Dwayne Eskridge. Dwayne mm -hmm. Eskridge was one of the most electrifying players in college football. He played receiver for them. He would take handoffs. They even played him at, at, at DB from he was such a, uh, such a dynamic athlete. Seattle Seahawks just took that dude in the second round of the NFL draft. This dude, number one, Jalen Hall, for them, is faster than Dwayne Eskridge. He is one of the fastest players in college ball. It is documented. He is bona fide sub 4-4. Four, four. 
and Vincent Gray was trailing this guy by a step, step and a half and still made a play on him. It doesn't matter that it says Western Michigan on the front of his chest. That dude has NFL speed and Vincent Gray just made a play on the football, uh, a play on the football that I don't know he makes last year, guys. And there, are, there are good football players everywhere. You look at the draft every year; you get quite a few players coming from the MAC and the Mountain West. Uh, they're getting drafted ahead of people from a lot of the Power Five conferences. So sometimes kids develop late, or the Power Five schools make a mistake, or they fall, and you get quality football players at other schools. So, uh, like I said, I don't listen to sometimes what the fans say because you know what. Most of them on the fence. When the wind blows, that's the side they take. And I'm sorry. That's just me. That's what's great about being retired. I no longer have to be political. I can call it what I want to call it. It's like the leaves and the trees. As the wind blows, they flow. I'm good. Hey, but the fans that's love. Hey, but fans, fans, the fans love you now, man. They, you know, they they love you. everything you do, everything you say. They're gonna love you, Vance, because you're gonna you're gonna impart some some wisdom. So impart some wisdom. Both of you guys now impart some wisdom upon me and the fans about your approach with the team as you're about to face a Washington squad that they were ranked number 20 in the country. They just lost to an FCS team. All right. They lost to an FCS team that I mean, even without their top four receivers, which is what happened to Washington in this game, they went into it with their three top wide receivers out. Their fourth receiver, he he went out the first play of the game and was lost for the game. But this is a team, Vance, that had across the front, they averaged 6'5", 325. They have a guard that's 6'6", 360 pounds. Their center is a sixth-year guy. So they're all they're all five are returning starters. They're huge. They, you know, have a wealth of experience. They're supposed to be able to run the football, but they weren't able to run it on Montana because Montana didn't really have to respect the pass. And yet you just got to believe. And I'm sure you talk me through how you would talk to the team. You got to believe that we're going to see if, if you're telling your team, guys, we're going to see a different Washington team. Is that not what you would say to your team, Vance? Is that not what you would say well, to the team, Al? Because I've been at Michigan. If I was at Michigan right now, I'll pull, I would go back to 2007 and show the last drive of Appalachian State and how Michigan lost that game. And man, we need to get ready for this next game. This team is going to be fired up. So if you're thinking that they're not going to show up, they have all their guys back, they're going to be ready to go. We're going to set a different Washington team than what you just saw on video. So if you're going to look at that and look what happened to Michigan in 2007, we can have problems. So this game is over. Don't let one game either beat us or win a game. It's over with right now. We have a lot of things to improve from this previous game. We can't make the same mistakes this week. If we do, we will not win this ball game. But if we continue to improve, we're going to take care of business. And now we're going to be one know it's this coming week. What would your talking point be, Mr. Borges? Well, uh, for, uh, first of all, I think Michigan, it does, it, they just do just what Vance said, they'll win the game. And I think they will win the game because Washington is formidable. Washington could not run the ball. They ran the ball for 62 yards. So you can bet that's going to be a huge emphasis for them this week because the quarterback did not play particularly well. And the quarterback's a better player than that. They are lame at receiver. They got problems at receiver. They're going to have to probably recruit some off the defense. They're in mm -hmm. such bad shape. But they are, if you look at their front, defensively and offensively, they are a power five team. They're legitimate. And they'll come in here as a wounded bear. And if if, if they're taking, if they start thinking they can beat them just because they lost to Montana, I think you're crazy. But I don't think Michigan's going to do that. I think Michigan understands the task at hand. I think that... Uh, once they get into the arena, the competition and the adrenaline starts that you're going to see some good football. I don't think you'll see complacency. I doubt seriously. Gotcha. All right. And I, I guess my last one would be from a strategic standpoint, Vance. I'm, I looked at this game uh, at the beginning uh, or be prior to the season thinking, man, how are they going to match up with a, a huge team like this up front who has them 
uh, outweighed by, you know, 30 pounds across the front on average. Now, it does not look as intimidating. I'm, this is not to downplay Washington as a team that can come here and beat Michigan. They certainly can. Uh, but I had serious, serious questions about Michigan's front, defense front being able to hold up against that offensive line from a defensive strategy standpoint. If you're going against a huge offensive line, what can you do tactically? What can you do strategically to, to maybe mitigate that size disadvantage? What are some of the strategies you would employ against huge front when you were at a size disadvantage against a team like that? I think Michigan showed that in the first ball game. I mean, you line up in one front, then you stem to a different front. Mm -hmm. They did a lot of angling angling and slanting. In other words, they move in the front quite a bit. They're bringing the nickel back. They bring the mic back. They bring the free safety. So you keep guys on the move. You just sit a guy in front of a 6'6", 300-pound guy the whole ball game, he's going to get killed. I mean, so I'm going to tell all my guys up front, everyone on this football team will have the opportunity to make a play. We're going to angle you to the left. We're going to angle you right. Now we're going to let you go vertical, hit this guy in the mouth. Next time, we're going to drop you and bring another guy. So we can try to keep the offensive line off balance for different movements. And I think they showed you in the first ball game. So I'm excited to see what these guys are going to do uh, Saturday at 7 o'clock. All right. Well, Vance, man, appreciate your time. And Al, appreciate your time as well. The expertise that we get is I'm sure there is not uh, a school in the country that has two coordinators breaking down the game film like you guys just did for Michigan's opener. We're going to do the same thing next week. So I hope you guys enjoyed the end or the second part of Michigan, the Michigan football breakdown brought to you by the Michigan Insider. We'll be back next week with more Al Borges and Vance Beffer, so we'll see you then. Go blue. Go blue.